share them in in our uh, channel, um, YouTube channel, and other people can come in and see those even after the seminars. So please do allow us to do that. And um, at some point, I will ask us if we can towards the end, if we could put our, our videos on so we can get a picture of uh, all of you. Um, and um, uh, it's it's usually good for, for us and we require it by SCB S to, to try and do that whenever we can. Um, again, very much uh, welcome all of you to um, another of our seminars, uh, Zimbabwe Conservation Live. And um, we team of a number of Zimbabweans that are leading the Society for Conservation Biology Zimbabwe chapter. And I want to acknowledge team, Diane, Nobesutu, um, who have been driving uh, this together with myself. I am the current president, team is the vice president, Nobesu to the president elect and Diane, our treasurer. Until last month, we also had Leo, uh, a colleague as well as secretary of our, our chapter and he stepped up, he stepped down. And so we're looking for a new secretary. If you can, we really encourage you to um, do apply uh, send an email to me, to team, to Diane or Nobesutu, and we'll be happy to provide more detail. We're really looking for young people and old and what, whatever you are, as long as you've got a zeal to make this happen and to keep this, uh, you know, build the chapter, would really like to hear from you. Um, just a little bit about us and um, want to share this information so that um, you, all of you, uh, if you've had it, you probably think, you know, it's getting a little bit boring, but it could be that there are a few people that are with us for the first time and we just want to share this with them so they are aware of these details. So as a chapter, we've started we, uh, last uh, year end of last year and we have a website where we curate and put in information uh, as needed or as um, it, it comes uh, round um, as we create it on the zimscb.org uh, website. Please, we encourage you to visit there uh, once in a while, uh, at least twice a month before the seminar and after the seminars, see what's there. We have uh, blogs, we have a variety of information there that we'd like you to have a look at. And you can contribute some information as well, which is very important. We'd like this to be a part, um, a, a member-driven uh, initiative. And um, towards that end, we've also had um, a, a survey that we did and we in the process of finalizing our strategy, which we believe will be truly member driven because we've got an input from a lot of you. And um, as part of that, we, we want you to, to, to reach out to us and provide information and uh, ideas as you see necessary. Because we are a chapter of the Society for Conservation Biology, we encourage all of you to be members. Uh, I know that a lot of you are already members, but we really, really want to encourage all of us to be members of this global society. I often say when I speak about Zimbabwe that um, one of the things I feel privileged about and, and you know, special about uh, Zimbabwe is the fact that we've always had conservationists, scientists that, um, do stuff that has global import. And uh, so uh, let's be part of uh, SCB Global and participate as members. Um, in the website and as part of our activities, we are bringing together some resources, um, library resources online, um, uh, soft copies, and uh, Diane is leading that initiative. We, in the final stages of trying to get it up and running. And if you've got any literature or papers or things that you think uh, might be useful for that, please do reach out and let us know. We'd like 
uh, uh, to have that. Um, we also looking at uh, doing a horizon scan and Nobesutu is leading that and um, uh, we will be in touch with more detail uh, uh, about that. The other thing that I have already mentioned is the blog. We do have a blog, please look out uh, at that. The last one has been done by Leo, uh, which is brilliant. He works on lions um, and um, he, he's written a brilliant blog, Lions in Your Backyard. And uh, as a frontline worker uh, dealing with lions, I think it's, it's an important contribution and wonderful to have it. If you've got a blog, please, if you can reach out to um, Tim who will um, uh, work with you to get the blog up on, on our website and uh, edit it as well. So uh, reach out to him as soon as you can. The last uh, plug for me is that we, the ICCB, that's the International Congress for Conservation Biology, hosted by SCB, Society for Conservation Biology, is being held online this year from the 13th to the 17th. And registration has already opened. If you submitted an abstract, it's probably been answered whether you got that. And we really encourage many of you, wherever you are, to be a part of that big meeting and contribute. And also lots of courses and variety of things, talks, wonderful talks happening. And so be, be a part of that. Um, the last, well, I, I, I said the last, but this is really, really the last uh, before I introduce our speaker today is we just want to, we know that some of you might not be able at this juncture to be paid up members of SCB, um, but we really would like you to sign up as a friend of our chapter. And there is a link there um, or on our website where you can sign up as that. Uh, as well. If you already a member, please do sign up as well so that we have a list of those that are signed up, uh, uh, fully paid members of SCB and those that are friends uh, clearly there. We required as well to have a list of our members and uh, would like as many of you to appear on that list. So, um, I would like to do a quick introduction of our speaker today and um, just want to say, you know, it's, it's great to see um, lots of colleagues who have worked with Johan and um, to see Raul as well. I worked with Raul uh, when I was at uh, WWF in, 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 in Harare, so good to see you, Raul. Um, I feel absolutely privileged and honored to introduce Johan to uh, all of you. And as a committee and chapter, um, it's an absolute honor to have you, Johan, giving a seminar to all of us. Um, uh, many, many years ago, uh, I went to the UZ and as an undergrad, and uh, that's the first time I heard about Johan. Uh, when I started in the Department of Biological Sciences. He, at that time, had left uh, to teach at the University of Pretoria, where he was chair and professor. And uh, people spoke about him very fondly. And I remember hearing how he had been instrumental in the development of the Tropical Resources Program, um, commonly called TREP, at the UZ, which was providing an important um, uh, postgraduate education at master's level for the region and beyond. Um, but, you know, his work at Pretoria and since, since then has uh, been um, one that I've followed. And um, if you've been in the sector in Zimbabwe, I'm sure you've also done the same. And Johan has gone from UZ to South Africa. He's had stints um, as a researcher, lecturer, professor in Norway, Cambridge, um, visitor, and since um, I think 2005, been in the US as professor uh, at the university, State University of Utah. And um, he's sought after as an editor, advisor, examiner, and reviewer by journals, students, and universities and institutions around the world. 
I think in all of that time, um, I'm right to say he has been both engaging on Zimbabwean topics of international relevance and importance. He's written five books on topics such as rewilding, elephants, rangelands, and uh, I read the, the Kruger experience many years ago and he was an editor and also written on sustainable use. His research output is captured through over 120 uh, peer reviewed papers and still counting and mon many more other publications. And he has collaborations around the world, including with uh, Oxford University and many others. One of the things um, that we, you know, makes us really very, very privileged to have you, Johan, is that when we started the chapter, we were really encouraged, and I can say this personally by your support, and uh, we've continued to greatly value that and look forward to putting uh, your expertise and support to great use in the coming months and years. So uh, we're delighted to have you. We welcome you today and um, as usual, um, Johan will speak um, and uh, please do get your questions in the chat and um, we will have a discussion there, thereafter, a QA and a that uh, Diane will um, 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 uh, moderate. And uh, so without further ado, I would like to say uh, welcome, Johan, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, MX, for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, shall I share my screen now? Yes. Okay, can you all see my full screen without my notes? That looks good. Okay, great. Right. Well, it's a huge privilege to um, be talking to Zim SCB, and I think it's a fantastic development. Um, and uh, with the advances in technology in communication, we here we are all over the world uh, with a common focus on uh, conservation of biodiversity in Zimbabwe, which is a fantastic thing. So when I was asked to give a talk, um, I had to think of you know, what to talk about. And um, it really struck me that the development of Zim SCB is a, an auspicious development in that it enables a group of, of people to start influencing um, the way in which biodiversity might be conserved or managed in Zimbabwe. And, and clearly there's, there's a dire need for that. But it, there's a big challenge, you know, how do you start? How do you, how do you gain entry into the problem? How do you actually go ahead with uh, what, uh, what, what you guys have got planned, which is um, a horizon scan? And how do you get your arms around all of the issues and specifically to identify the real fundamental core issues that are most important to draw attention to? Not only problems, but also opportunities. And so what I'm doing today is I'm just offering some suggestions for how to proceed in terms of trying to get the right focus to draw political attention, to draw um, international attention, to try and get support to move forward with real effect in terms of achieving conservation uh, success. So that's what I'm talking about. And um, what I'm going to suggest is three things. And I'll unpack each of those as we proceed. So my suggestions are, first of all, to think outside the box, to use the knobs, and to think process as well as pattern. So let's get started on that with, first of all, thinking outside the box. Now, this is a, a bit of a cliche. And the term to think outside the box comes from the business world and it comes from a little bit of a game in which you have a box in which there are nine dots. And the challenge is to draw four straight lines through all of the dots without lifting pen from paper. 
And it's actually really hard to do unless you think outside the box. So those lines can be drawn, but the only way in which they can be drawn is if you actually, um, laser pointer here, if you actually go outside of the box. And so this problem cannot be solved by thinking inside the box, okay? And there are many issues in conservation which require thinking outside the box. And I'll give you some examples. So a classic one here, Serengeti. One of the biggest uh, draw cards for conservation focus and attention on the planet. And uh, the Serengeti is famous because of this migration of wildebeest and zebra. And the wildebeest um, utilize the Serengeti ecosystem, which is largely based in Tanzania, in the Serengeti National Park. And um, in the wet season, around uh, you know, December, January, the migration is in the south and the southern plains. It then moves up to the Western Corridor where there um, is water in rivers. And the reason that the migration leaves the Southern Plains is because it's a very flat area and there are pans of water that develop when the rain falls and there's obviously green grass too. But then that water dries up and those pans dry up. And so the animals have to move to where there are rivers. And in the Western Corridor, there's the Grumeti and other rivers where these animals can graze wildebeest and zebra are water dependent and they, can, and they can drink from the rivers, but those rivers dry up. And then in the dry season, the migration moves north and it crosses the Maasai, uh, sorry, the Mara River. And uh, it's a very dramatic scene and, and uh, it's, it's, it's classic in terms of wildlife movies, seeing these animals crossing the river. And then they head up into the Mara game reserve in Kenya and they feed up there. And then as soon as the rains come again, they move back down into the Southern Plains. So a spectacular thing, but the government of Tanzania has been talking about building a road across the Serengeti. And that is to connect the areas along the shores of Lake Victoria within Tanzania with the hinterland, essentially uh, the, the, the city of Arusha. Now that has drawn a huge amount of international attention about how dare Tanzania interfere with this global treasure of biodiversity by building a road across Serengeti National Park, which would potentially interfere with the migration. And you know, a road going across there, vehicle traffic could crash into animals during the migration. The migration might be reluctant to cross a big road perhaps. Um, and it's just kind of, almost sacrilege to think of doing this. And so there's been this huge amount of attention. So should this be an issue? Well, obviously it's an issue. Building a road across a national park that, like that really is an issue. But let's think outside the box here and think why does the migration go up to the northern part of the ecosystem and indeed cross into the next country, Kenya? Well, the reason is that you have got the Mara River and the Mara River runs with surface water during the dry season. And that is what the animals need to drink from. And if you have a look at the Mara River Basin, it is mostly in Kenya. And the headwaters of the Mara River are up in the Mara Forest. The river flows down through Mas Masai Mara, then into Serengeti and then out to Lake Victoria. Now, if we have a look at the land use in the Mara River Basin in Kenya, we see that most of it is under agriculture. And there is some forest, and the forest, particularly the Mara forest, has been a major concern recently with regard to deforestation. Now, this agriculture is increasingly irrigated from the Mara River. And with the, uh, the growth of the um, with agribusiness in Kenya, growth of the urban population in Nairobi, demand for uh, vegetables and crops, agriculture is intensifying. And so abstraction of water from the Mara River for agriculture and diversion of the Mara River for hydroelectric power could result in the Mara River running dry in the lower reaches when it goes through the Maasai Mara and into Serengeti. Now, hydrological models have shown that if um, there is a 
a not unusual drought, could be not necessarily a one in a hundred year drought, but maybe a one in a 10 year drought. And with climate change, that's more likely. If the Mara River were to run dry by virtue of this combination of drought and abstraction upstream, it would result in a complete collapse of the migration. And not just a collapse because they don't go there, but they would just simply die. They would stand around the river that is dry and die. 80% of the Vildivis population in the Serengeti would die in one year. Okay, so um, some fairly, um, you know, un, unlauded, unpublished, un, un, uh, you know, papers that have been published but haven't reached a lot of fanfare in fairly obscure journals, soil journals and hydrological journals have pointed to this. But the attention that the road has got is huge, whereas the attention, the attention directed to the Mara River is by no means um, as intense, but is probably much more significant. So that's an example then of looking outside the box to try and identify a really big issue that really needs some attention. And I'm pleased to say there is attention being directed. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to give the impression that nobody's thinking about this. In fact, I know WWF is doing um, a lot of work on this, but the international conservation community doesn't really seem to be aware of this issue compared to the road. And then of course, when we come to the issue of diseases, um, and livestock and wildlife, we really have to think outside the box. Um, this is a classic example of where the tools that are commonly used to address problems um, are the tools that have been developed for livestock. And then veterinarians who, who are very rarely trained in wildlife ecology will directly apply tools that they find in their toolbox that they've been trained with to wildlife situations often with um, really bad results. So what I'm going to do now to give you an example of that is to really jump across to where I work right now and um, introduce you to my study area that I'm working on in this part of the world, in the Rocky Mountains. And here we have an example of Rocky Mountain elk. And Rocky Mountain elk um, are a, a population or, or a species of, of, of animal with an expanding population driven by the demand for trophy hunting. Um, the population is, is, is growing rapidly and is expanding in habitat. Um, and it's the Yellowstone, greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which has been the, the real refuge for, for the species which, and from where it's expanding. Now in the Rocky Mountains, uh, the various state wildlife management agencies, such as uh, the Wyoming Fish and Game Department, they have a program where they feed the elk in winter in certain places. So they will put out hay or alfalfa in order to keep elk herds away from the cities. And the reason is, is that the, the natural winter range of elk would be in the low lying areas, the valleys, and those are now filled with people and their farms and fields and cities. And so these elk have got to go somewhere in winter. And so the state agencies establish these feeding stations where they put out uh, food and attract the elk there. Now, unfortunately, the brucellosis is a disease that has now got into the elk population. And brucellosis is a disease that causes, it's a bacterial disease that causes spontaneous abortion in uh, pregnant um, adult females. And the disease is spread by virtue of the um, aborted fetus and birth fluids being contaminated with the bacilli, the, the, the bacteria, and other animals are often um, interested. They have a fascination behavior for the fetus. They will sniff it and they will pick up the bacteria. And the other thing is that these birth fluids lying on, on the grass are contagious. And so animals that are grazing the grass will pick up the, the infection. And so the disease spreads by virtue of this abortion that occurs. And brucellosis can then infect a variety of ungulates, cattle get it, um, and so it's a big problem. Humans can also get it, it's a zoonotic disease, it can cause a very nasty disease in humans. And so with this disease now in elk, there's a big concern, what to do about it, and it's in one of the species that is now the sort of flagship species for conservation in Western America. So some work has been done on this by uh, one of my grad students, Gavin Cottrell and Paul Cross, who some of you might know, um, who's worked uh, with me in, in Southern Africa, and I'll talk about his work a bit more. 
But um, essentially what we've got here is a situation where prior to the 1980s, brucellosis was introduced by cattle. So cattle were brought into Yellowstone National Park to provide milk to tourists um, in the early part of the 1900s. The disease spread to bison. And then from bison, it spread to elk that are fed at feed grounds in winter. And these segments of the ecosystem have populations that we call maintenance populations for the disease. So the disease is being maintained in those populations. From the elk that are fed in winter, it has also spread to elk that are not fed, that, that occur in areas where there are no feed grounds. And these are free ranging animals in winter that are moving around and are not being fed. Then from 1980 to 2000, the disease has steadily spread into the non-fed non elk and veterinary controls have now re resulted in the, the cattle moving from a maintenance population to a non-maintenance population. And these veterinary controls involve a combination of quarantine. So the cattle that are infected in a herd are retained on the ranch, are fenced in. And with veterinary testing, it's possible to identify animals that are infected and to kill them. So it's a test and slaughter program. And then cattle can also be vaccinated. And so by this regular monitoring and a continuous program of test and slaughter and vaccination and quarantine and very strict controls on the movement of cattle across uh, boundaries between farms and specifically across state lines, the disease is no longer being maintained in the cattle population. It is being maintained by bison. It is being maintained uh, by your uh, fed elk. And it is now spreading in the, in the 1980s to the 2000s in the free ranging ones. And now at post 2000, we have a situation where it is now being maintained in the elk that are not fed. It's being maintained in the elk that are fed. It's being maintained in the bison. And there's regular spillback from elk to cattle. So the ranchers are up in arms and they tell the wildlife management agency, you've got to do something about this. Now, the only sort of tools that are known for controlling this disease are tools that are used in livestock management. And so what does the wildlife management agency do? It says, well, when we feed these animals in winter, they're all coming into the feed ground. So we can grab them then and we can do what the veterinarians do to cattle. We can test them and the ones that are positive, we can slaughter. And so that's what happened. So for four years from um, 2008 to 2012, I think it was, um, there was a program at, at one of the large feed grounds in Wyoming where adult female elk were driven from the feed ground through a chute. They would be ear tagged, they would be aged from dental uh, inspections and then blood would be drawn and some of the blood would be used to get a quick test um, using a card. And essentially this card is a, is a card that's got a number of wells in it and there are reagents that are impregnated into the card. And you put a drop of blood in the well and you leave it for a little while um, in a warm place, like essentially um, in front of the heater on the dashboard of a pickup truck in the snow. And if it starts to ag aggregate and you get this granular appearance, then it's positive. If it stays clear, then it's negative. So what this means is, that is there's a reaction to the antibodies for brucellosis, and these are positive animals. If an animal then tests positive, it is shot. Okay. So for six years, they did this. They moved the animals through. All the positive ones were eradicated because that's what you do with livestock. Um, and clearly, the population... Um, of, of elk at these feed grounds was, was significantly reduced. Okay, so let's have a look here then about what, what's going on in epidemiology within a population. So the basic elements of epidemiology is essentially that you have three compartments within the population. You have susceptible animals that are not yet infected, but that, will, that could become infected. Then if they do become infected, they are the infective animals. And then some of those will recover. Okay, and there are probabilities of transition from the susceptible to the infected groups. Uh, the probability infection lambda here will determine that. And then the probability of moving from infected to recovered is determined by a probability sigma. And there's an interaction. 
And that as you get a larger segment of the population in the recovered group, then we started to get what's known as herd immunity. And so therefore the probability of a susceptible animal becoming infective is reduced because now the, um, the proportion of individuals that are recovered and have got their own antibodies and protection to the disease is now increasing. Okay, now by using all of the blood data and by using all of the age data, the numbers of animals, et cetera, Gavin, my PhD student, who's a, who's a genius, was able to build statistical models to capture all of these complex interactions. And, and what was involved here was using par uh, partially observed Markov process modeling. And he, what he could do is he could play around with the probabilities, he could play around, play, play around with the numbers, and he could figure out how does the, the uh, intervention of test and slaughter work? And here's what he came up with. So what he modeled here was seroprevalence. So this is the proportion of the population that is positive for brucellosis over years. And here between 2006 and 2010 is the window of time in which the tests and slaughter happened and a large number of animals were killed. Okay, so what we can do here is we can model the effect on seroprevalence of this period of intervention targeted specifically at seropositive animals, at animals <clears throat> with, if there was a scenario of just no action, doing nothing. Um, and then paradoxically, if they were to target negative animals, so if the agency had just shot animals that were negative, sounds crazy, but we modeled that. And then if we just culled at random, if, if they had during these years had just sh shot animals at random, to reduce the population by the same amount as they did if they had taken out just the positive animals. And here are the results. And what we see is, first of all, that if nothing was done, the seroprevalence was, was dropping. And that's typically because, and this is very common in wildlife disease issues, is that the intervention only happens after the outbreak has occurred. And so this outbreak had actually happened, and the animals were now <clears throat> moving into the recovery mode and the contagion was actually starting to reduce. So it was coming down anyway, but nevertheless, the test and slaughter drew down very strongly the seroprevalence in the herd. And you would expect that to happen, all these positive animals were being removed. But they stopped in 2010, there was a lot of public outcry about this, these animals were all being killed, and it, it, was, it was really worrying. And also they had drawn down the seroprevalence to the level that they thought the job was done. So they stopped and wham, it came back. And it came back so quickly that by 2017, the seroprevalence was the same as if they'd done nothing. Now, if we have a look and see what would have happened if they had culled the same amount of animals, but had actually targeted the negative animals, animals that had no antibodies, they would have drawn the seroprevalence down and it would have been a more sustainable and a more effective long-term result. And if they had just culled at random, they would also achieve, have achieved a more effective result. And what happened here is that they were targeting, targeting the recovered segment of the population. Many of those positive animals were not just infected, but most of them had recovered. And so they were killing the animals that had the antibodies, that were contributing to herd immunity, that were protecting the susceptibles from becoming infected. And so that's an example where an intervention happens in a wildlife situation using a set of tools that is most apparent to a wildlife management agency, but they hadn't thought outside the box by thinking about, is that really going to work? And so this box of veterinary tools used to manage brucellosis and livestock does not work for free-ranging wildlife. And we now have a situation where there are elk intermingling with, with, with cattle in Wyoming and Montana and Idaho and Utah. And the only thing that can be done is to control the disease in cattle. There's no point trying to go out there and kill wild animals that are carrying the disease. It just doesn't work. Huge amount of money spent, completely pointless, except that it gave us a wonderful research opportunity. Okay, so <clears throat> that's a little bit about thinking outside the box. The next thing I want to talk about is to say, use the knobs. What I mean here is to think of the analogy of a microscope. 
Now, anyone that's done basic biology, like MX did in biological sciences at UZ, would have learned that when you want to use a microscope, you put a slide on the stage of the microscope, you then use the knob to crank the objective lens right down to just above the slide, you then look through the eyepiece and you rack back until you start seeing some image in focus. And then you move back and forth to get the right focus. And you might use another objective lens and start again, but you can't get the right focus without racking back and forth and looking at your object with various levels of magnification and considering different scales effectively. And so I want you to think of this analogy with regard to thinking of biodiversity problems and opportunities. And this can be done by looking across spatial scales, across temporal scales, and across institutional levels. So I'm going to start off by talking about spatial scales. And we can jump in here to look at elephants and African savannas. And um, you know, this is a picture here of common lands in Zimbabwe. This is elephant habitat which is being um, fragmented and transformed by conversion to, to agricultural fields. Uh, the trees are being cut down and burnt. Fields are being cleared and planted. So that was elephant habitat that is now um, open field. And it's well known that humans and elephants are in competition. And there was a classic paper done by uh, Parker and Graham published in 1989 which showed that using data at the district scale in Zimbabwe, this relationship between elephant and human densities is linear. And it's a very strong linear relationship. The R squared value is 0.98. So 98% of elephant density variation can be explained by human density. So it's a very powerful regression model. And the fact that you have a regression model means that you can plug in for X, a certain human density and get Y which is elephant density for a particular area. So for human density I, you can then predict elephant density I. For human density J, you can predict elephant density J. And it is a linear relationship and it's continuous. And the assumption is therefore that if you can, for example, at any, uh, in any way, try and maybe reduce human density in an area to try and encourage wildlife, you would get a commensurate increase in elephant density. Or you can predict forward and look at the way in which human density is increasing in an area, and you can predict forward to see how elephant density would decline. So this linear relationship is very attractive and has been used a great deal. Many, many, many uh, applications of this uh, regression model have been used during the years. But then <clears throat> if you use the knobs, and you look at another scale of resolution, and now you drop down to the ward scale in Zimbabwe within a district, you might see a different story. And this is what was done by Richard Hall, working in Zimbabwe in the Binga and Sabungwe district. And he dropped down from the district scale to the ward scale. And he came up with this plot. So what we have here is elephant density and human density. And we have a scatter of plots. Of, of points. Now you can fit a regression model to the scatter of points, and indeed you will get a significant regression line, a significant model with a regression line, and it's not statistically different from the Parker and Graham model. But what's really important here is that when you have low human density, you have a wide range of elephant density. Some areas are good elephant habitat, some are not. At low human densities, elephants can survive quite happily with humans. And as human density increases, elephants can kind of move around them. But you reach a threshold of human density, and then suddenly we have a tipping point in terms of the capacity of the system to retain elephants. And once you exceed that threshold, elephants just are gone. And so the really important relationship is not linear but in fact, nonlinear. And it's a threshold relationship with the distinct step function that happens at about 16 to 17 people per square kilometer. So that is not a continuous linear situation. And the way it happens is that we get a flip in the system in which you 
start off with a system in which you have elephant habitat with patches of cleared land, and you get more and more and more land becoming cleared. And there's a, a pretty rapid transition to a new stage in which you now have got cleared land with patches of elephant habitat. And when the areas of these patches of elephant habitat are now too small to support a breeding herd of elephants, they go, they disappear, they're gone. And so it happens very quickly. And so it's really important then for planning to understand that if you look at one scale, you might see one relationship. If you look at another scale, the relationship could look very different. And depending upon the scale at which uh, management interventions can operate, you have to choose which pattern to follow. Now, management interventions normally happen at a scale of the organism. And these animals are living in herds, they have got their home ranges, and the people that are living with them are living and operating at a scale which is not the district scale, but was much more close to the ward scale. And so I would suggest that by moving down scale to the ward scale gives a more realistic image of what's actually happening out there. You can also <clears throat> apply this analogy across temporal scales. And here I'm gonna give uh, some sort of conceptual thought to this. If we have a classic example of a typical population, of organisms, it could be plants, it could be animals. And if we have a, a case where monitoring begins at a certain time t, so we've got time t on the x-axis and we have population size n on the y-axis, monitoring is relatively, is usually quite recent. Um, it's usual that we only get data quite, quite recently because interventions and surveys and so on usually are relatively recent. Now, if we pick up a situation where when monitoring started to when monitoring is now, there's a steady decline, we could take this pattern and we could put it on new axes and we would come up with a classic disaster scenario where we've got population size N against T and we've got a steady decline in the population. And that sets off alarm bells immediately. And management would say, we need to now get the population back to where it was back here okay but if we then use the knobs and we open up this the, the the scale of resolution we might find that in fact this population follows any one of several possible uh, trajectories it might be that in fact the carrying capacity of the population the equilibrium density of the population is much higher than it was at the start of monitoring or it could be that indeed yes the equilibrium density was what it was at the start of monitoring. Or it could be that this population follows a stable limit cycle and is just on the downward swing of one cycle and might well pick up again. Or it could even be that the population used to be at a low equilibrium level, went through an eruption, perhaps because of predator release or some kind of a disease control or some habitat change or maybe some climatic factors, and is now returning to its equilibrium. And so it's really important, if at all possible, to try and get as big a view on a temporal scale as possible to understand what's really happening with the system that's causing concern. And to illustrate that, I'll talk about uh, another disease, bovine tuberculosis, African buffalo. Bovine tuberculosis has uh, become a major problem because obviously it influences cattle and it's also potentially influences humans. And it has got into the buffalo population in South Africa and has moved up into Zimbabwe and to other parts of Africa. Now, there's nothing you can do about bovine tuberculosis in a large wild population. It's just nothing you can do. Uh, you can't control it. It's much too uh, costly to do any test and slaughter program. But what is important is that if management is trying to find animals to move from a large population, elsewhere to re-establish, to reintroduce buffalo into new areas, it is highly problematic to get disease-free animals um, because you don't want to go around spreading this disease everywhere. But there's a high demand to get buffalo into private game reserves that are disease-free. And from a conservation point of view, it's also important to get buffalo back into the system because they have a very important ecological effect. So what do we do? <clears throat> Now, I just want to draw attention here to some work done by Alex Caron, who many of you will know, and again, Paul Cross, 
who've done fabulous work um, on, on disease in wildlife all over the world. This was a study done by Alex um, in the Kruger Park where he looked at the body condition of animal of, of buffalo on a condition index score, which ranges between one and five. One is virtually dead, is in terrible condition, and five is in really, you know, show body condition of prime fat animals. And so between two and 3.5, we're dealing with animals that are between sort of poor body condition and good body condition. And he looked at three areas where there's zero prevalence, low prevalence, and high prevalence of bovine tuberculosis. And he looked at the buffalo in the early dry season and in the late dry season. And in the early dry season, it didn't really matter what the prevalence level was. They were all in pretty good condition. But in the late dry season, we see that the areas with a high prevalence of BTB, the animals were all in a much lower body condition to the areas where they were in low or zero BTB prevalence. So this tells us that the disease is interacting with the nutritional limitation and is driving down body condition much harder than otherwise. So what do we do with this information? Well, if we use the knobs and we now look at the buffalo population um, dynamics back through time, we see here, this is for central Kruger, the buffalo population increases and crashes, increases, crashes, increases and crashes on a regular basis. And if we have a look at rainfall in relation to buffalo population growth rate, which I've plotted down here, we can see that the buffalo population growth rate plummets every time that the three month running mean of rainfall crashes too. And so these um, shaded bars are droughts and they occur about every 10 years on a regular basis. So what this means is that the buffalo population is crashing during the drought, is recovering, is crashing during the drought, is recovering, is crashing during the drought, recovering. Okay, and this, these are data that go back into the 1960s in Kruger. It's an amazing data set, wonderful data set collected by the management of Kruger using aerial survey methods for, for decades. And, and, and just a very diligent effort has managed to collect this data set. And I was able to use those data to see this pattern. Now, what this means is that we have windows of opportunity that we would not have seen otherwise. Just as these animals are emerging from the drought and the populations are starting to grow, this is when we are dealing with a population in which the BTB positive animals have been washed out to a large extent. Not all of them, but many of them have been washed out by virtue of the harsh conditions in the drought interacting with the morbidity of the disease. And now obviously the disease wasn't here, wasn't there then in the 70s and 80s, but from 1990 onwards, we've got these opportunities. If you want to take buffalo from a large wild population where there's bovine tuberculosis, in order to reintroduce to other areas, capture them after, just after a drought, move them into bomas, and then you do your, um, your test and slaughter and your quarantine, and then you will much more rapidly be able to develop a disease-free herd than if you were to catch your animals when they're at high population levels and the disease is much more prevalent in the population. So by using the knobs, we see an opportunity now to be able to manage this disease more effectively and to safely be able to move animals uh, from a large wild uh, population in which you've got endemic disease into a captive situation where you can manage the disease in, 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 a, in a much better way and then move them safely into reintroduction sites. Okay, we can also use this analogy by looking across institutional levels. Now, this is a big issue in Zimbabwe, I know, with uh, Campfire, where the Campfire program is, is being considered as to what is the appropriate level to allocate authority for managing wildlife. Now, appropriate authority was initially allocated at the rural district council level, and that has proved to be problematic through time. So that institutional level was selected as being an appropriate level, and, and all indications were that it would be a good one, and it was set up like that. And many of the speakers uh, that, that are online now and, and previous speakers have talked about the fact that that institutional level is probably not the best one. 
Now, if you drop down below that, you've got the ward level, you've got the village level, and you've got the family level. And somewhere in between family and rural district council is what we call the community. And that's this fairly amorphous range of institutional levels that one might think about looking at to get the right, um, the right focus for applying a community-based conservation uh, model. And that community is, is kind of hard to work with. Um, the classic, ex classic expression is that the community is like um, an elephant in the dark. It's big, it's dangerous, and it's hard to identify. So what I'll do here is I'll talk about an example which has proved to identify the appropriate institutional level to settle on. And this comes from work in Maasai land in Kenya. Now here we've got a paper which is just out, it's just online uh, at the moment in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, the Journal of the Ecological Society of America. And this is work done by uh, Pete Tyrrell, amazingly smart uh, PhD student at Oxford, where he was supervised by David MacDonald and myself. And what Pete did is he looked at the situation where land ownership in Southern Kenya has been revolutionized over the last 20 years. Uh, land privatization started in the 1980s where there was a demand by rural people to actually own their land. And then title was awarded. And in various areas, it's spread um, through Maasai land in, in Southern Kenya. And the area around uh, Mara uh, National Reserve became privatized largely in the 2000s and it's still going on. So what happens <coughs> when land becomes privatized? What we find is that fences immediately jump up because people want to identify the area that they own. They can sell the land because they have title, they can get cash and they can do stuff to the land which they couldn't do before. And so what Pete did is he had a look at how are land prices in Southern Kenya affected by a variety of factors in order for us to understand the way in which biodiversity is likely to go in the future. And what he did is he used uh, tools from data science and he scraped data off of online real estate advertisements from online newspapers. And he could scrape off the land price um, in, in dollars per acre, and he could scrape off the uh, location of each land offering. And then he ran a number of analyses. And he, what he's got here is he's had a look at the effect of various covariates on land price. And so we have an effect size. And so this is, the, this is a statistical um, translation of how the covariate is affecting land price. And he looked at potential maize yield, distance to Nairobi, and distance to Masai Mara Reserve. And as you would expect, as potential maize yield increases, in fact, you know, as, as land uh, productivity increases, there's a strong positive effect and land prices increase in areas with a high potential maize yield. That's entirely what you'd understand. By the same token, distance to Nairobi, the closer you get to Nairobi, stronger effect on land price. That's also to be expected. There's a high demand for land near the urban areas. But now look here, distance to Masai Mara Game Reserve, from about 100 kilometers away from the border, as you get closer and closer to Masai Mara, rapid increase in land price. The same trajectory as towards an urban area. And what's happening here is that private land around Mara is highly valuable because there are some very wealthy game lodges, private game lodges that have built up reputations for themselves outside the park. And so the ecotourism industry, this is pre-COVID I must say, although we've, we're just publishing it now, but the ecotourism industry has given that area a cachet and land price is now very valuable. So people are buying land just as an investment so that they can then potentially build a game lodge. And of course, they fence it and so on. Now, the guys that used to live there, the people that the community that used to live on that land, they've sold the land and they've made quite a lot of money. It then gets bought by some other person, a, a speculator who sells it on. 
um, there's been a lot of talk about the, the way in which these land transactions are going is rather strange in that it's, it's, it's turning over quite fast. And uh, there's a lot of speculation that in fact, it's used as money laundering from illicit activities, particularly re related to Somali pirates and so on and so forth. So land is changing hands at a rapid pace along the border of Mara. And the people that uh, occur there don't own the land anymore. The owners of the land are non-resident. And so what happens is that the trees get cut down and turned to charcoal, fences go up, um, and the area is pretty much trashed. And so now surrounding Mara Game Reserve, surrounding one of the world's most renowned wildlife areas, we have got a situation which is really not conducive to biodiversity conservation. So it's a major threat. And so land price is a really important covariate to consider when thinking about threats to biodiversity. But then interestingly, some people have got ahead of the curve. And one group in particular of, of in the Maasai community have formed themselves into the South Rift Association of Landowners called Saralo. And they have established what they call a group ranch. And what they did is instead of selling off their land, they said, no, we're gonna stay together as a community. We're gonna keep our land the way it's always been because we need the land. We need the pastoral, traditional pastoral activities and we can live with wildlife. And they want to maintain their traditional customs and their traditional lifestyles. And so what they've done is they've gone for that zone in between local government and private family ownership. And they are settling in that zone, um, which is the community. They've got their own community game guards and the biodiversity in, in, in that area, the Southern Rift is, is great. Um, and and the, the welfare of the people is higher certainly than the people who sold their land around Mara and are now living in the slums around Nairobi. So again, this is an experiment, a social experiment that's happened, looking at moving right down to the private individual level, the family level, private ownership. Zimbabwe has shown that rural district councils is probably not the appropriate level. And in Maasai land, the organizations such as Saralo have shown that this community level in between is probably the sweet spot. But it's important to have look, to look at those examples to try and get closer to where the opportunities lie. Okay, and now what I want to do is to end off by thinking about process as well as pattern. And now <clears throat> pattern is when you, you look at a pattern on the landscape and you measure it and you see what's there. And so that's like, for example, counting animals. Um, wildlife surveys will give you the numbers of animals and populations. And it's very common to monitor those trajectories through time and warning bells emerge when you start seeing a change in the abundance of animals. And that is obviously very important. You need to monitor those data. But it's also important to consider what those animals are doing in the ecosystem. What are the functions? What are the processes that they are responsible for? And what's happening to those, those ecological interactions? So with elephants, for example, mega herbivores, each one of these animals will grow into an animal weighing more than a thousand kilograms, usually four to 5,000 kilograms in a lifetime lasting maybe 70 years, during which time these animals are feeding on the vegetation and they're assimilating nutrients from vegetation that other animals cannot do. These, these elephants can eat uh, woody vegetation, they can eat roots, they can eat bark that other animals cannot eat. So they're taking these nutrients and they're building up tissue in their bodies where nutrients are sequestered. Then, <clears throat> Nutrients are transferred through the animals in the way of dung. So they're turning over nutrients, they're contributing to nutrient recycling. And then when they die, the nutrients from their bodies are returned back into the ecosystem. And so what these animals are, are more than just a number of, of organisms on the landscape. They are a processing component of that ecosystem, which the ecosystem to a very large extent is influenced by. And so losing the numbers of elephants in an area might be very important just from a point of view of population management, but then also the interactions are being lost. So 
to really express this, I need to take you a long way away to the, to the deep ocean. And I've been fascinated by the research that's been done on the great whales. Um, and of course, you all know that the great whale populations were, were very heavily impacted by commercial whaling back in the 1800s. Um, and well, the great whale populations in the deep oceans were very, very low um, around the early part of last century. Those whale populations have started to recover. And we're starting to see some really interesting things. When a big old blue whale dies, its body sinks to the bottom of the ocean and lies on the seabed. And that's an area where there's no light, it's extremely cold, there's very little life going on there, but suddenly this massive influx of nutrients emerges, applies, you know, falls onto, onto the floor. And there are specialized organisms that feed on that carcass. And they will keep feeding on that carcass for decades, probably centuries. And these are specifically adapted organisms. And then another one comes and falls. There's another whale fall a certain distance away. And then organisms can then move from one carcass to the next. And as the whale populations are recovering, these whale falls are coming down again and again and again. And gradually we're repopulating the seabed with whale carcasses. And when you get a certain density of whale carcasses, suddenly, bam, you've got this network that gets established and you've got a layer of biodiversity now just shooting out across the seabed that wasn't there 50 years ago and is returned. And the, the spike in biodiversity is, 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 is quite dramatic. So looking at that, I was thinking, well, what happens in terrestrial ecosystems? Going right back to the dinosaurs, we had these huge lumps of meat falling dead on the landscape. Mammoths, mastodons, woolly rhinos, now moving forward into, into our present times, we've got all these mega herbivores, but they are now doing the opposite of the great whales. They are disappearing. And so what are the effects in terms of this layer of biodiversity? So <clears throat> the question is then, what are these ecological legacy effects of mega carcasses in terrestrial ecosystems? We need to understand this before it's gone. Now, these large carcasses of elephants, for example, represent a phenomenon which is quite unique. Small carcasses like zebra and buffalo and impala and so on rapidly get consumed by scavengers and the nutrients get dissipated across the landscape very, very quickly. And so the nutrients in the bodies of those animals are in a sort of a constant steady state of recycling. But with mega herbivores, you've got these massive skeletons that are too big to be dispersed by your scavengers. And so you have this carcass that is lying out on the landscape for decades with phosphorus particularly leaching out of these bones. So an average elephant carcass has got half a ton of bone, which is phosphorus rich. And everybody knows that phosphorus um, from bone, bone meal is, is a very important fertilizer. So now we're getting this, this hot spot of nutrients on the landscape in which it's possible for propagules of plants to establish at a site where they might not be able to get established before because there might not have been the level of nutrients that they're adapted for. And so what we'd expect over time is if we have a, a carcass, an elephant dies, and we look at baseline plant species richness at that site, we would expect plant species richness to plummet right down because at that site, you've now got all of the blood and the guts and the, the meat decomposing, all of the trampling from the scavengers, all of the feces from the scavengers, denuding the soil, and in fact, poisoning the soil, the soil with ammonia, and there's essentially just nitrogen toxicity. But over time, that will dissipate. And then your species number, species richness increases as the community assembles. Back to baseline. And then over time, you're going to be able to get species propagating in that area that are adapted to high fertility sites in addition to the background species in the community. And so species richness will increase above baseline quite significantly and then slowly tail out over decades back to baseline again. But there'll be another elephant carcass nearby and another one and another one. And so what we have is we have a dynamic system operating across the landscape in which we have a specific meta ecosystem that is adapted to mega herbivore carcasses, which 
represent a layer of biodiversity across the landscape that would not be there if it was not for those mega cargos. This is just like the layer of biodiversity across the benthos of the deep oceans that would not be there if they were not whale falls. And so we could look at an elephant population and see the numbers of elephants decreasing and get concerned and focus on those numbers of elephants. But we should also be thinking about what's happening to the meta ecosystem that is supported by the elephant carcasses on that system. So you can look at a pattern, you can go out to an area of savannah and you can do surveys and you can measure what's out there right now in terms of numbers of animals and densities of plants and species representation, et cetera, et cetera. But if you really look into it, you will see that there are likely to be various meta ecosystems, some of which are supported by, for example, termitaria, some of which are supported by elephant carcasses. And it's the entire combination of all of the base ecosystem, which is determined by parent geology and rainfall, combined with these meta ecosystems that are layered on top, one of which would be determined by, for example, mega carcasses. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that I've just got a, um, a project funded by the National Science Foundation where we're looking at this now in the Kruger National Park. The hypothesis is that mega carcasses maintain this distinct meta ecosystem within the matrix of a savanna ecosystem. And so, um, you know, I'd just like to draw attention to that to indicate that it's more than just the pattern of animal numbers, but the interactions with the rest of the ecosystem that's important when we're considering biodiversity conservation. So <clears throat> just to wrap up then, I have these three suggestions for identifying biodiversity threats and opportunities. Think outside the box, use the knobs, think a process as well as pattern and do it all concurrently. Okay, and that's where I'd like to leave. I think I've gone probably a little bit over time. And so I'll leave it right there. It's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, either raise your hand or just pop your question into the chat box. Um, I'll start off. Uh, I think these the, uh, was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, makes me want to leave everything behind and go and be a student and, and think interesting thoughts um, all the time. And I guess the question is, what are the skills that we need, the practical suggestions for skills, for training, for courses that need to be introduced into academic programs to enable uh, to enable students to do these these things think outside the box use the knobs and, and think process as well as pattern you know I think I think um, certainly in Zimbabwe we have you know a growing number of ecology programs um, or biodiversity conservation programs um, and, and what do we need to do to introduce these types of uh, innovative thinking skills into these programs? Yeah, that's a great question, Diane. Um, you know, what, what, I would, what I would answer is to say that we need to attract a diversity of intellectual contributions to any particular problem. And, you know, yeah. I'll, MX mentioned in my introduction that I was very involved in TREP, the Tropical Resource Ecology mm. Program at the University of Zimbabwe. And we set that up as, a, as, as a, a collaboration between the Department of Biological Sciences and the Center for Applied Social Studies. And so there, what we did is we had a, a truly interdisciplinary program. And I was also very fortunate to be able to get a European Union funding so that we got a link in with the University of Edinburgh. So we had people from Europe coming in. We had Zimbabweans who come, were coming in from the biological, ecological side, and we had Zimbabweans coming in from the social sciences side. Right. And what we had at that time was a, essentially a think tank where people were encouraged to think outside the box. People were encouraged to challenge boundaries. People were chastised if they just jumped to the immediate answer that they thought they could mm -hmm. find. Um, and uh, 
I, you know, all I, all I can say is to do what Zim SCB is doing right now is to get a diversity of thought from across a multitude of disciplines yeah. to look at what the problems and opportunities are from a diversity of perspectives. Brilliant. Well, you've just put the challenge on us for our future speakers. So, so thank you for that. Um, there's a question from Grace uh, regarding the Serralo uh, case study, uh, wanting to know more about the char characteristics of the community. Um, Grace, I, I'm wondering if you want to take the floor and ask your question directly. If, if you would like to, just pop your um, microphone and or video on. I'm just going to draw um, my blinds. The sun has come up now. <laughs> For people who don't know, Johan is in uh, the Rocky Mountains, so he woke up very early to, to give us this, this uh, seminar. Um, Grace, uh, well, pop, pop on if you want to. Um, but in the meantime, I will, um, I will ask another question, which is, how do you integrate this type of innovative thinking into policy. So, so how do you convince maybe risk-averse policymakers to, um, to, to sort of encourage them to take some risks and to have policy experiments based on this type of you know, scenario planning that might be outside of, of strict policy initiatives? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, how do you how do you get uh, politicians excited? How do you how do you get them? Um, involved. And, and what I would suggest is to be able to tell politicians not only what the problem is, but why it's a problem. Yeah. And to also be able to say that if the problem can be solved, what are the benefits? Not only to, you know, biodiversity as a whole, but to them as representatives of their constituency and to the long-term future of, of people in an area that are going to be drawing judgment uh, yeah. regarding the actions of the politicians. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, you know, I, th I, th I think if you, if, if you can go to influential people and say, here's a problem, this is why it's a problem, we believe you can make a difference, and if you do make a difference, this is what's in it for you. Yeah. Okay, no, no. So what that means is having the full picture. You can't yeah. just go along and say, uh, you know, elephant numbers are declining. Yeah. We've got to stop it. That's not yeah. good enough. Okay. Yeah. You've got to have the whole picture. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, Navasutu, have we lost you? Your hand was up. Oh. And are you there? No, okay. Take, take, take. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, no just problem. Problem has already been uh, responded to but um yeah thank you very much johan for the great talk i'm still going to just uh pause what my to just put my thinking out there um so you spoke a lot about um like how scientific evidence is, is being used for decision making something which you actually wrote about in your paper in 2004 on um, current challenges um, that eco uh, for ecologists in the terrestrial ecosystems. I think that was the title of the paper, which I think for that time, really, it was a good paper because that's 2004 and I think it's still relevant, you know, because it speaks to a lot of um, things that um, ecologists, that could help ecologists have impact um, in conservation and become more assertive in providing um, scientific evidence that's used for policy making. And also um, there was a publication that came out, I think that was in 2020 or 2019, um, that spoke to ecologists being in the landscape of fear um, mm. that's in the conservation sector itself. You know, this is because of the um, um, growth in um, say, um, political populism. So those are some of the challenges. Um, this is, this, I think this is like an evolution now when it comes to research, conservation, and where we are at the stage. And still, I think it is important 
um, that we become more uh, open-minded and also use the tools that you shared with us. But I'm also thinking like in this landscape of fear and all that is happening politically in our world, how at this stage can conservation um, ecologists become more assertive and mm. utilize all the knowledge and have an impact when there are all these other um, challenges that are being faced in the world, which are related to the economic growth and of, and politics as well. Um, yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Sorry, it's too long. <laughs> Brilliant question. Yeah, it's a tough question, and and um, you know, ultimately, I think that's that's the issue. Is is <clears throat> how how does a group of like minded conservation biologists, ecologists, sociologists, and so on, actually make a difference? How, 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 how does it happen? Um, especially in an environment where, there's, where there are political tensions. It really is a challenge. Um, and all I, can, all I can recommend is to engender discussion, uh, to have an open forum, to have interdisciplinary uh, thinking and discussion, and to be very strategic about the message that gets put out there. Um, in, in the US, where there's an enormous amount of freedom of speech, environmentalists have developed something of a bad reputation for being over emotional, bunny huggers, um, hippies, greenies. And um, that's because whenever there's some environmental issue, there's there's a big row, there's a, there's a big fuss, there's a big emotional outcry. And that doesn't always work and is often counterproductive. And so it's important for uh, conservation practitioners to think a little bit of a, ahead of every crisis and think, let's run through this, let's get our act together, let's get our message together, let's think about how that message is going to fly, and then let's put our message across in the most effective way. <clears throat> and um, you know, I, that's, that's all I can recommend. And that, that requires, in a country like Zimbabwe, that, it, that requires uh, a certain amount of organization. It requires a certain amount of trust within the organization. Um, it requires um, inputs from a diversity of sectors. And I think what you're doing right now is, is exactly what's needed. Great, thank you. Um, so I think the question from Grace is around understanding more about the characteristics of the Seralo, um case study and uh, what makes that community so resilient um, against the, the many forces. Um, and, and she also notes uh, to draw the parallel to, uh, for example, the Nyangambe community in the Save Valley, um, which, you know, which is quite a successful uh, community conservancy that's now been integrated into the, the bigger conservancy. So um, if, if you want to respond to that, that's great. Otherwise I have found the link to the article, which I'm going to pop into the chat. Yeah, I, I can't really answer in much detail because I'm, I'm not by any means an, uh, uh, fully in, engaged in Saralo. I've interacted with the organization, which I find to be extremely impressive. Um, yeah. And essentially what, what's happened there is that the leadership of the local Maasai community um, includes members who are very well educated and who are very um, engaged in, in business and, and in politics. And that's, that's important, they're influential. Yeah, yeah. And they value their traditions and their culture enormously. Um, and they could see that privatization of land leading to fragmentation, fencing, charcoal burning was going to destroy absolutely and completely destroy the traditions and the community. And fortunately, they still had time to be able to say, listen, we need to move this land into a group ranch and establish an organization to manage. It. And it's, uh, to my mind, it's extremely impressive. I mean, they've hired um, professional ecologists, I mean, PhD trained scientists to, to do a lot of their work for them. They've got a, a team. Uh, of, of specialists who, who are employed and on the payroll to, to provide them with the information they need. But it is managed by the community. It's managed by 
the, uh, the, the, the people who are influential in that community who are determined to retain their culture. And their culture is bonded to having open spaces and livestock in a pastoral nomadic system together with wildlife. So that's, I think that's what yeah. it takes is, is having committed people from the community who have the skills and the, and the leverage in government to make yeah. it happen. No, absolutely. Okay, fi final comment, and then I think we need to close. Um, Raul, did you want to um, ask your question yourself? Or happy for me to read it? Just unmute yourself if you'd like to. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Raul. You know, in Zimbabwe, the aid organizations have a massive influence, a lot of leverage on what happens, um, yeah. particularly in the in impoverished rural landscapes. And um, they rush into their projects, they throw a lot of money around for a while and then they, they go off or the program manager is cycled around and, and, and goes away somewhere else and a new one comes along and reinvents the wheel. Um, and I, I do think that there should be some process and ideally pushed by the Zimbabwe government, obviously, as the lead agency to, to review the long term effects of these projects in terms of some of the, the, the untoward effects and problems and complications such as Johan mentioned. Environmental impact assessments may be done on projects, but you actually need to reflect after a period of time on what's actually happened, not just speculate what might have happened in a project and then do it and walk away. So I do think, really, we should be mature enough now to start finding a way to retrospectively do major interventions. Thanks. Yeah, I just jump in by, by agreeing completely, and, and I think... Uh, something that, that Zim SCB might be able to achieve is to achieve a, uh, a running agenda of uh, conservation problems and opportunities that um, should attract attention. So when, when international conservation agencies or private individuals wish to engage, um, they have an opportunity to see what the agenda actually is at the moment and, and how they could most effectively engage. Um, and at least if that resource is there, that will certainly help. Having you know, some legislation to force it is another story. I don't know how that would work, but at least being able to point to that agenda and to have it um, science-based, evidence-based and regularly updated would be very helpful. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that is, I'm taking furious notes as I'm sure my other committee members are as well. So I think two of our projects speak to this and perhaps we need to have a little bit more thought into how they become more practical. One being the horizon scan and the other being the resource library. So the resource library really as an attempt, not only to gather the peer reviewed literature that's out there, but also the gray literature. So project reports um, and, and, you know, meeting reports and all of that type of thing, because I think, um, and any of us who've worked in, in Zim know that you go to a thousand meetings and beautiful notes are written up and then what happens? So at a minimum, even if you had a, a willing sort of aid agency that was willing to look back and, and learn from result from past projects before starting a new one, how would they even find the information? So, um, so I think that that may really help us to focus our efforts um, in terms of those two projects under SCB Zimbabwe. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you everyone for that. MX, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Johan. This has been probably, I think Raul will agree with me, uh, one of the best seminars we've had, very thought provoking. And uh, uh, Raul, uh, big brother has delivered, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so we we're so grateful for this and lots of thoughts for us as well as a team uh going forward on some of the things that um we need to probably uh be doing the running agenda i think is 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 wonderful ideas and just bringing everybody together will continue to do that can I ask everybody if you can, if you can get onto your video just for a few moments so that we can um, all just um, give uh, Johan a round of applause. I know we all in different places, but if you can uh, wave through just to say thank you. Thank you. Um, 
David and Meg there. Just, just wave, give one more moment. If you all of us can get onto our cameras and uh, give a wave to your hand for such an excellent um, presentation. Uh, yes, thank you, Johan, that was absolutely great. Yeah. Hi, Johan. Excellent, brilliant. And team, if you can just take a photo, if you can remain, just take a photo of everybody. Thank you so very much. Okay, you ready for brilliant. a photo? Three, two, one, smile. <laughs> Got you, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, just before we close, we just have two more minutes. I just wanted to run through a few things, um, first, including our next um, seminar. Uh, Tim, if you can just get the presentation up um, for, 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 for all of us. Um, just want to really say you, um, our next seminar, we've scheduled it for the 30th of September, and um, we've got a lawyer coming through to talk about um, wildlife law. Uh, Eva Chinoda has been with uh, uh, Parks Department and has started an organization, uh, Speak Out for Animals. Uh, she is an advocate of the High Court of Zimbabwe and will speak about wildlife law. Um, we've a couple of seminars coming forth on uh, forests, on fresh water as well, that we would really like to encourage you to keep your eyes peeled out for the announcements on those. So 30th of September, please do put it in your diary. Um, same time, similar time. And then the other thing, um, just a reminder that the uh, ICCB will be online. Please do register as from the 8th of September. And if you've got a, a talk, we would like to, to hear about that and perhaps advertise within the community of our chapter as well about the talks that many of us will be doing during that uh, conference. Um, Next slide, team. Um, so, yeah, it's okay, Tim. Uh, let's go back to that. So, we we just want I want to end by saying, um, Johan, thank you so very much for this insightful presentation. It's uh, been so full of uh, uh, thought, and um, I think this, uh, some of the things you put there. Uh, show how if we put our minds to things, we can come with unorthodox solutions, uh, but it, it requires us to put our minds together and think through those. So thank you so very much. Want to say thank you to everybody that's been able to attend. And uh, we look forward to communicating with you in the next few weeks about our forthcoming seminar, as well as our uh, strategic plan as a chapter, which we are now in the process of finalizing and it should be ready at the next uh, um, seminar as well. So once again, thank you very much. Have a lovely day wherever you are. If it's morning, have a good morning. If it's afternoon, a good afternoon. And if it's getting to be the evening, have a good evening. And thank you so much, Johan, for a brilliant presentation.